Uh, let's talk now entertainment news. Joining us live with your entertainment headlines is eTalks Chloe Wilde. Chloe, great to see you on this Monday morning. So, unfortunately, starting off with some sad news, we've seen so many deaths uh, recently, and now in the world of fashion, iconic French designer Thierry Mugler has passed away. Yeah, Thierry Mugler is oh, and was such a force. I mean, this is a man who sadly passed away um, at the age of 73. It was shared by his team on social media. And this individual was so creative. So he was born in France. He began designing in the 70s and very quickly uh, began became known for his dramatic avant-garde designs and definitely caught the eye of a lot of celebrities throughout his career. Um, I mean, he has made designs for the likes of Lady Gaga, Kim Kardashian, Cardi B, Madonna, Cindy Crawford, George Michael, David Bowie, Nicole Kidman, Megan Fox, Katy Perry, Rihanna. I could keep going on and on. It was very avant-garde. It was very unique, which is, I think, is why celebrities really flock to his designs. A couple years ago, uh, the eTalk team and I had the chance to go to Montreal to actually go to one of his design exhibitions where we could see firsthand the level of artistry in the designs that he made. And I was completely blown away. This is an individual that was in the space for a long time, occasionally would retire, but then would come out for special occasions like, oh, I don't know creating costumes for Beyonce's 2009 I Am World Tour. Um, this is someone who will be sorely, sorely missed in the fashion industry. Thankfully, his designs will live on. But in the meantime, definitely sending uh, our thoughts and love to his friends and family. Yeah, and, and last week, uh, we didn't get a chance to talk to Tracy Malshore, but Andre Leon Talley also passed away. So that's uh, two big losses for the world of fashion in just a span of a week. All right, Chloe, next up, uh, we do have a bit of a spoil alert for the fans of the show Billions. Yes, okay, so if you haven't watched yet, please go ahead and block your ears. I don't want people coming after me on Twitter, but I'm letting you know now there is a spoiler alert. So we are talking billions and we are talking Peloton. So not that long ago, the Sex and the City reboot came out. And again, another spoiler alert, uh, Mr. Big unfortunately passed away from a heart attack from being on the Peloton. This made waves. Of course, Peloton was not super pleased. They seemed to recover quite quickly with an ad. And now here we are once again talking about Peloton and the small screen, except this time it's in the show Billions. And it, it involves Mike Wagner and the season six premiere of the show. Um, I don't want to reveal more than that. Does mm -hmm. he live? Does he die? You have to watch and see. But this is a, a kind of an interesting trend that we're seeing Peloton keep popping up. And interestingly, in Billions, they actually reference reference um, the Sex in the City situation that happened with Mr. Big, um, where one of the characters says, I'm not going out like Mr. Big. So I'm curious to see what Peloton does moving forward, because in a statement, they did share that um, they don't understand why their products are being used this way. Mm -hmm. And uh, they didn't agree for their brand's IP to be used in the show. So I have a feeling this story will continue to be developing. Wow, that's really interesting that they even referenced uh, the Sex in the City Peloton. That's almost like the Russian doll of taking down Peloton in these... Uh, TV show cameos. Okay, uh, Chloe Wilde will continue to follow that story for sure, but thanks for joining us this morning. Take care. Welcome back. Based on the posthumously published best-selling memoir of the same name, Salt in My Soul is a new documentary that explores the heart and mind of a young woman, Mallory Smith, and her quest to live a full life knowing full well it would be cut short by disease. Now here with more is Salt in My Soul director Will Battersby, and Mallory's mom, Diane Shader-Smith. Both of you, thanks for joining us today. Good morning. Good morning. Diane, I'm gonna start with you. Cystic fibrosis was Mallory's diagnosis, but she didn't let it define her, her life as a death sentence. What, what was the source of her strength and her desire to share this experience, you know, living with this insidious disease? I think she had an intuitive understanding that if she complained or talked about her disease, that it would be a turnoff to people. And she wanted to just have fun. She spent so much time living in her house, wherever she was, doing treatments and taking care of herself. And by stepping out of that shell when she was with her friends, she got to live some semblance of a normal life. Mm -hmm. and, in and in terms of the writing, I think that that was her outlet. That's where she put all her frustrations and her pain and her fears. Will, there was so much source material here over 2,500 pages of these secret diaries, 
hundreds of hours of uh, video and audio. How hard was it to distill all this down into a single documentary? It was, um, it was both, you know, it was difficult, but it was also uh, sort of a dream for a documentarian. You know, mm. there's nothing worse than uh, scant archival, uh, you know, where you're sort of trying to manufacture something. And, you know, Mallory, I think, you know, as Diane said, you know, the writing, the audio, the, the secret videos, uh, the podcasts, you know, it was her way of really sort of expressing herself and putting something out in the world while she was living, you know, in, within the sort of shell of this disease. Diane, you lost Mallory now just over four years ago. We often hear about the grief cycle, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, um, and that now many experts in the field will say that acceptance and closure is kind of a myth and that, you know, we never really get over a, a loss like this. We, we just learn to sit with the pain, and that pain is actually a teacher and that wisdom, wisdom comes in through the wounds. What wisdom have you acquired through this? Well... I've really learned the single message that if you work to create a legacy around your loved one, it helps you and it helps others, especially if you can figure out how to put that pain to good use. We, we, we in my grief group describe it as turning pain into purpose because it gives you a reason to live. It allows you to continue to spend time with your loved one. And in this case, we have both a magnificent book that Mallory wrote and an incredible film that Will created. So I'm a very, very lucky grieving mom. Oh, that's beautifully said. Uh, Will, there are new therapies and, and state-of-the-art, frankly, groundbreaking science that's also highlighted in this film. Tell us a bit about that. Right, so uh, in Mallory's final days, um, her dad, who's extraordinary, Mark Smith, um, had been researching something called phage therapy, P-H-A-G-E. Um, which is actually a very, a very old therapy that predates penicillin, uh, which is a way of uh, natural things called phages that will uh, attack bacteria in your body. And um, essentially, you know, they're realizing that this is going to be key to fighting superbugs. And Mallory was the second person in the United States to, to get phage. You know, she got compassionate use because things were so dire at the end of her life. Um, and, you know, what? unfortunately, Mallory didn't get it in time, but what they did discover in autopsies that it actually was working. So, um, you know, as much as this is a sad story, there's this extraordinary turn, uh, you know, which, and, you know, her case is definitely going to help save, you know, thousands of lives. It's already saving lives. Uh, so that's the kind of, you know, the, the incredibly hopeful message coming out of this. Diane, uh, what has COVID taught you about, you know, treating, you know, living through, uh, you know, a difficult time, uh, trying to, you know, promote wellness versus treating illness as we all go through this collectively as a planet. Well, the most striking thing about COVID is how similar the protocols and limitations are to what Mallory and everyone with CF lives with. Mm, right. Because the masking, the social distancing, all of those things that you do, the hand washing, the Purell, that's all the same protocols that the cystic fibrosis community lives with. And what I think it did was the other way around. I think it taught the world what CF lives with. And from my perspective, I've used this time to give talks, to share Mallory's story, because what I hear over and over, and it does propel me forward, whether they hear it through me speaking, Mallory's writing, or the film that Will has created, is that Mallory inspires people. And at mm -hmm. this time, we're all feeling distraught and shut in, and our mental health is affected. I think there is a clear message that no matter how much time or whatever your quality is, you have to find joy in every day. That is the message. Whether it's a beautiful cup of coffee that you've gotten from your local coffee house that's freshly brewed, and by the way, Will's wife has a coffee shop, or whether it's finding something to watch on TV, like Salt in My Soul, that inspires you, or taking a walk in nature. It doesn't really matter what it is. You have to learn how to find simple joys. And it has taught us all to slow down and to appreciate what we do have, I think. Salt of My Soul, the, the memoir, uh, this documentary, they're both really a hymn, I think, to the human condition and the spirit that, you know, love, love will beat fear every time. You just have to give it a chance and be patient. It's uh, quite a, it must be quite a gift for you, Will, to have been part of this project from the beginning too, huh? It's been fantastic. It's taught me so much, really, to kind of, you know, savor every day, uh, you know, get the joy out of life and, you know, not be afraid to feel all the emotions, you know, that we've all been feeling in these last couple of years, but also to, 
you know, take take a step forward and uh, and you know, as you say, kind of enjoy your loved ones and enjoy life. Salt of My Soul has uh, theatrical screenings right now in the States. Uh, it's released on video on demand today in Canada, the States, and the UK. Uh, Will and Diane, I thank you both for your time and sharing this incredible story uh, with us and our audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, as we've been saying all morning, this is the 12th annual Bell Let's Talk Day, inviting Canadians and people around the world to join the conversation about mental health driving unprecedented change. And talking about your mental health in your first language, well, it's not easy, so imagine trying it in your second or perhaps even third language. So for more on the support based on the language you speak, we are joined by SciMood founder Fred Newman. Uh, good morning, Fred. Thanks for joining us here on CB24 Breakfast. Explain uh, the sort of philosophy behind SciMood. What is it that your organization is trying to do here for people who may not speak English as their first language? Yes, thanks, Nick. Uh, yes, SciMood provides mental health support based on language and cultural background. We started uh, with the assumption that it's not easy to talk about your mental health issues in your first language. So imagine having to translate everything for a second language. We started this with uh, Rodrigo, my friend and I, five years ago, uh, when we struggled to have mental health support in the Portuguese language uh, with the Brazilian specials living in, in Toronto. So uh, we, we started doing research on that subject and we realized we had this mission to help the Canadian population uh, to have a better mental health support based on language and cultural background. So what do you do here, Fred? Do you, are you sort of finding specialists, are they all in Canada or could they be anywhere but they sort of better understand perhaps cultures and languages and therefore can make a better connection and, and help people more? Is that the idea? Yes, uh, more than 50% of our mental health specialists are currently living in, in the province of Ontario, but we have over 320 specialists uh, living in 21 uh, countries and speaking 35 languages. And so what have you heard from, from people who, who, who've used, uh, it's, it's a platform, what I understand, from, from using SciMood that, that, that have sort of been able to find mental health help in their own language. What's the reaction? What's the response been? And what have you then heard from the people who are helping these people about the progress they're able to make because of, you know, overcoming language barriers? Yes, we have seen the struggle that newcomers have when they come to to this, to settle in Canada, and you have the, all these issues. Sometimes you're a father who struggles, and you have all the pressure of uh, putting things on the table for your family. And for specialists, uh, they know that they can uh, help support these families by uh, talking to each one of them and saying that it's okay uh, to talk about your mental health issues, that everyone is, is human and you have your limitations and it's very important to do this through th therapy and, and talk about those mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a nutshell, it's like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is Bell Let's Talk Day. You talk about the importance of talking, but but the, the thing that we hear a lot is that it's actually hard for people to even find, uh, you know, a therapist or not, you know, get stuck on a waiting list, et cetera. How does SciMood perhaps help in that side of things? Yeah, so we started SciMood when it took us two months uh, to find a, a therapist, even with the help of uh, Rodrigo's father, who is a psychiatrist in Brazil, he had connections in, in here. So we, we thought, hey, if we have this help and it's still very difficult, we should uh, set up simud.com to help everyone. And after we did that, I found my therapist using Simud, and it took me one week to do that. And we know that the specialists also, uh, when they come to Canada, they want to start working here, they want to study, they want to go to college to continue their education in here. And uh, Simud is the place for them to to do this uh, after they, they complete their studies. And we offer mental health support based not only on language, but also uh, for the LGBTQ community, First Nations, Afro-Canadians, and every visible m minority who, who wants to find uh, mental health support with someone that can understand their background. All right, yeah, giving more access to more people. Okay, that is the founder of SciMood, uh, Fred Newman, joining us here on Bell Let's Talk Day this morning. Thanks for your time, Fred. Thanks, Nick. 
Well, Canada's push to the podium is gearing up as the Beijing Winter Games are now really just around the corner. And one of the major medal hopefuls to watch is Winnipeg's Heather McLean, who's going to be representing Canada as part of our long track speed skating team. Heather, thanks so much for joining us here on CB24 Breakfast. I know you head to Beijing on Saturday. How are you feeling today just a few days before your departure and going to be wearing the Canadian flag yet again? Uh, what's the feeling like? I'm getting pretty excited. A wave of our athletes actually just arrived in Beijing. So I just checked on Instagram this morning and I could see a little bit of the village and a little bit of the dining center as well. So I'm getting really excited. I bet you are. Now, uh, this season so far, I think it's fair to say not your best season, you know, in, in competition so far. How do you hope to turn that around and how are you feeling about your training now leading up to Beijing? I've had a quite a few weeks um, since I've competed last. So I've had a lot of time to go back to training, um, back to square one and work on a lot of things. So with about six weeks of solid training since my last races, I'm uh, feeling a lot better and really hoping to have a better competition in Beijing. You know, when you head to Beijing, you know, it's it's going to be a different kind of Olympics than, of course, you were in, in the 2018 Games in Pyeongchang in that, in the, you know, it's there aren't going to be fans in the stands. Uh, you're going to be, you know, in this sort of COVID, you know, closed loop bubble. Does that change anything for you at all? Or do you, are you just so focused on what you're doing on the ice that you just block everything else out? Yeah, I'm pretty focused just on the competition so far. I'm glad that it's my second Olympics and I kind of got to experience um, what a quote unquote normal Olympics would be like in Pyeongchang. Um, and in terms of support, no, no Canadian fans are going to be there, but I've been receiving a lot of messages and a lot of people are getting ready to cheer us on in their living rooms. And um, I still feel the support. I wonder what that's like as an athlete, you know, knowing that even though you may not hear the country, you may not see those Canadian flags in the stands in Beijing, that knowing that an entire country, you know, on the other side of the world effectively is cheering you on. How, how does that make you feel when you're at the starting line? Are you aware of that? Or again, is it just the focus on the job at hand? When I'm on the starting line, I'm, I'm pretty zoned in. I only have a couple thoughts in my head of what I'm trying to do in my race, but definitely leading up to the race and directly afterwards, you just feel overwhelming pride and, and support from Canada. Well, Heather McLean, we're so glad you joined us here on TB24 Breakfast before you head to Beijing. Wishing you the best of luck at the Games uh, this time around. And uh, let, look, let's hope you bring home a, a medal or two. Good to chat with you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck again. In 2020, a group of current and former NHL players came together to form the Hockey Diversity Alliance in an effort to take a stand against racism and intolerance within the NHL. They have since partnered with Budweiser Canada to amplify their message with their most recent campaign, hashtag Tape Out Hate. Joining us live is HDA co-founder and former Calgary Flames player, Akeem Aliyu. Akeem, thanks so much for joining us today to talk about this. So the Tape Out Hate campaign, you and four other NHL players players of color sat down to shoot this video ad. It was expected to take just 30 minutes, but you guys ended up talking for about 90 minutes, sharing some of your darkest uncensored experiences of racism in hockey. What's the inspiration behind this campaign and what's the goal? Yeah, I mean, Budweiser obviously came up to us to, with, a, with a creative idea on something that's visible. Obviously, hockey tape is um, something that everybody uses on their sticks, but it's something, like I said, that's visible and it's out there and um, you can look at it and know that there's a message behind it. So the, the whole campaign is just to draw awareness around um, what the few players of color um, deal with in the game of hockey and how do we make it better for the future generation. So um, obviously, as you mentioned, um, that, that little round table fireside chat we had was supposed to be a quick thing that was organized, but um, it kind of got into, obviously we got into our feelings. It became raw and emotional when we started rehashing some of the experiences that we had. Um, but I think it was important. It made it a powerful statement um, for the hockey community, but society as a whole, that we have a lot of um, change that needs to be done. And we're hoping we, we can be on the forefront of that so the future generations uh, can have a good you recently uh, tweeted, hockey is for everyone versus let's make hockey for everyone. This is a slight tweak in wording, but such a big difference in meaning. Can you explain why you tweeted that? Yeah, I mean, uh, just to speak bluntly, we as a group and obviously myself feel that the NHL um, does a lot of things that are more on the performative side than actual um, things that, that, that'll make tangible change for the next generation. Um, so I, I think that when you say hockey's for everyone, that means you're making a statement that, that, that is so right now. 
Um, and I truly believe that the BIPOC community doesn't feel that way. Obviously, I talk to the few players in the game that are playing. Obviously, LGBT LGBTQ plus community feels the same way. Um, there's a lot of communities that don't feel included in the game of hockey. Everything that's going on with the sexual abuse, with the racial abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, a statement like that is really bold right now. Um, I was roommates with Kyle Beach when, when his situation happened. So when you say things like that, I think it generalizes everything. And the game's got a long way to go. We're very far behind the other top three, sport, three four sports in North America. Mm -hmm diversifying the game and um, I think when you say let's make hockey for everyone that's a tangible action that you can take to to aspire to get to somewhere right to change the reality not just stating what you think it should be uh, now Akeem you started the conversation this cultural shift I mean racism abuse these things have always kind of been in hockey but what's changed is people talking about it breaking that silence uh, you've been a fighter since you were a young kid standing up for yourself and your beliefs standing up against that hazing in the OHL uh, when you just started out and you said that really affected your reputation and your career as well as you know accusing your former minor league coach uh, Bill Peters of making racial slurs in 2019 tweeting about that do you think that racism is an issue at all levels of hockey yeah 100 percent it uh, it starts somewhere if you knew how many um, emails I get um, how many people reach out to the HDA how many people reach out to my foundation parents of young children dealing with racism every day um, we see goes what goes on in minor hockey and, and to be honest that's it starts somewhere it starts at an early age I think racism is taught um, I truly believe that um, and I think that there's a really big problem with that especially in a game like hockey that's an elite of sport um, that's not welcoming for, for everybody um, from different demographics and uh, different genders to obviously women's hockey. We want to help promote that as well. Um, so I do believe race is a huge problem. I mean, it's um, kind of followed me around every, every step of my career from hazing. But obviously there was a racial um, motivation behind that as well. And obviously what happened with Bill Peters and, and my time in Calgary, I feel like my career was derailed in a lot of ways because of it. Um, obviously, there's a lot of dark days, I won't lie to you. I worked my whole life to to be able to play in the National Hockey League and felt like I never got that opportunity. But what am I going to do to mm -hmm. like, make it better for the next Akeem Aliou or the next uh, kid of color? So that's kind of where my attention has turned to, and I'm hoping... A, um, I can pave a smoother path and we can pave a smoother path for the for the next generation. Yeah, and I think more needs to be done to make hockey more accessible. You talk about it being an elitist sport. You know, uh, Willie Ori, he's having his uh, jersey retired. He talked about being 15 years old the first time he stepped on an indoor ice rink. All right, switching gears to what's happening in the world of hockey today. You know, the East Coast Hockey League just suspended player Jacob Panetta for the rest of the season for making a racist gesture toward Jordan Subban. You know, NHL's uh, PH Subban band's brother who is black there was also a suspension in the AHL two weeks ago for another racist incident do you think that these kinds of suspensions are enough 30 days off the ice and does it suggest that the league officials are actually recognizing the issue now um, well it's funny that you say that the first racial incident that happened in the AHL was on the night that Willie Rees jersey was retired so um, it just it just shows the lack of attention to the issue um, from players and then obviously not 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 too far later 48 hours later the second incident happened with Jacob um, I I truly believe that um, there's a long way to go in this in this space I think that you should be banned for life when you make a racial incident but on the other side I think people make mistakes and it's also an opportunity for us to come together and and educate and and, eat and, um, and to learn from each other so um, in that sense, I think um, obviously the, getting the rest of the season is a, is a step in the right direction. Um, I'm hoping that these players can rehabilitate from that um, and take the appropriate actions to be able to educate themselves on the plight of people of color. Um, so like I said, I think uh, there's two ends to that. Um, and, I'm, and I'm hoping we can continue to push forward and, and, and do the right thing. Yeah, here's hoping. Akeem Aliou, thank you so much for chatting with us about the Tape Out Hate campaign, co-founder of the Hockey Diversity Alliance. Take care. Thanks for having me, Jennifer. Have a good day. You too.